This week, Michael Smith from Vercara is with us to discuss understanding KillNet and recent waves of DDoS attacks. Then, in the enterprise security news, AI security startups continue to emerge from stealth. Sierra becomes a cybersecurity unicorn, maybe. Eclipsium's binary analysis tooling. Wiz acquires Gem, which sounds like something that should be out of a D&D campaign. Vericode acquires Longbow, also sounds like it should be out of a D&D campaign. Uh, some excellent essays regarding data, data privacy, luck, AI, and customer love. The latest problems with generative AI and yet another Microsoft breach. All that and more in this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Greylog is on a mission to make threat detection and incident response easier, faster, and more affordable. They help cybersecurity teams reduce risk across attack surfaces with SIM, log management, and API security solutions. Their newest offering, Greylog API Security, adds a new layer of defense by discovering rogue APIs, monitoring for threats from inside the perimeter, and providing detailed guided responses. Full fidelity capture of API requests and responses ensures you can perform complete investigations and meet regulatory requirements. Some popular and persistent API myths have almost become threats themselves. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash Greylog and watch the video there to debunk the top five misconceptions surrounding API security. Are your security teams overwhelmed with nonstop alerts? Then say hello to Sentinel-1's Purple AI, the world's most powerful generative AI security analyst built to simplify and accelerate your SecOps. Purple AI is built on the most robust data lake in the market, enabling analysts to protect your organization at machine speed with natural language queries, threat hunting quick starts, smart response recommendations, and auto-saving investigation notebooks. See Purple AI in action at securityweekly.com forward slash Sentinel One. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy National 8-Track Tape Day. This is episode 357, recorded on Thursday, April 11th, 2024, and I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria. Uh, you know, my generation often makes jokes about younger generations not realizing the save icon was once a physical object that stored data, but even I'm not old enough to have ever handled an 8-track tape. Believe it or not, it was created in 1964 by a consortium led by Bill Lear. Yes, that Learjet Bill Lear. And by the time I was growing up in the 1980s, we just had compact cassettes. Yeah, I know some people still had eight, eight tracks. It just, you know, they were they were still around when I was growing up, but I, I never came across one. Uh, in fact, the compact cassette hit the market a year before eight tracks uh, eight, and eight track tapes did. So predates it a little bit. All right, a few announcements here and we'll jump into the interview. Security Weekly listeners can save $100 on their RSA Conference 2024 Conference Pass. RSA Conference will take place May 6th through May 9th in San Francisco and on demand. To register using our discount code, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC24 and use the code 54USECWEEKLY. That's 54USECWEEKLY. We hope to see you there. Also, if you don't have a hotel yet, maybe consider Airbnbs. You know, all, all the good hotel spots are probably taken or maybe consider, uh, you know, coming in using BART from Oakland. It's uh, a lot of folks get their hotels a year before the event. Uh, we'd also like to invite our listeners to be part of our prestigious 2024 SC Awards. Entries are officially open. The SE Awards continue to serve as a beacon of excellence, re recognizing the industry's best solutions, organizations, and people that are advancing information security. This year, there are 34 categories, many updated to reflect trends in artificial intelligence, cloud security, and continuous threat exposure management. This is your chance to shine among the brightest in the cybersecurity world. Take advantage of the early bird rate by April 12th. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash SC Awards to submit your entries by May 31st. All right. Today we're talking about understanding KillNet and uh, the latest state of DDoS attacks. We're excited to have Michael Smith with us today. And uh, Michael is Vercara's field CTO and is responsible for the 
organization's overall technology strategy, including product management, threat intelligence, customer support, and sales and channels enablement. It's a lot of stuff you're doing there, Mike. <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. Smith uh, initially started as a Russian translator in the U.S. Army before serving in CTO roles and startups and information security officer roles leading major government security projects. And during his 30 years, he got to do a lot of cool stuff, uh, like the, dealing with the DDoS attacks against user, major U.S. banks in 2012 and 2013 and attacks by e-commerce account takeover gangs, as well as security monitoring for the 2014 FIFA World Cup in 2014 Winter Olympic Games and preparations for both the 2018 and 2020 Olympic Games. Welcome to the show, Mike. Cool. Thank you. All right. So, um, you know, w- one of the first things uh, I realized is, is you you didn't change companies. Uh, new Star rebranded. So, yeah. Vacare is a, a, a new name about a year ago or so? Um, yeah, it, it was actually a, a year and a week ago. Um, we just had a little bit of an announcement, like the one year as Vergara um, announcements went out on social media just a couple of days ago. Gotcha. And it's uh, and so roughly still doing the same stuff there. Um, yeah, yeah. If you look back, this is a little bit more more history than probably we need to know. But if you look back, there was New Star, what we call Heritage New Star, um, and they had a business unit that did security infrastructure. Well, New Star itself was bought by TransUnion. They wanted New Star because they were a data broker. They provided a lot of information, including fraud detection and um, cellular number portability and things like that. Um, the cybersecurity and infrastructure piece didn't really fit with what their business model was. So they spun us out into a separate company that then became New Star Security Services. So for a period of two years, there was a New Star part of TransUnion, and there was New Star Security Services, which was independent. And then that was rather confusing. So last year, um, on April 5th of 2023, we renamed the company to Vercara, and we've been operating as that since. And I remember a fun fact from a few years ago that New Star was its own top-level domain, right? Mm-hmm. Like, is, is that, uh, so that doesn't carry over to Vercara? No, it doesn't. It doesn't carry over. We had to... Uh, was like there was a bunch thing. of, yeah, we, we had a, just the mechanisms of divestitures like that. We had a transportation, or not trans, transition support agreement that covered us out for a period of several years with different things like enterprise licenses, um, with email forwarding, with different domains. TLDs were part of that. Um, but yeah, they um, officially Heritage Newstar still has the dot Newstar TLD. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, so so jumping into the topic for today, um, you know, as I as I mentioned in the show notes for for this episode for this interview, uh, I, I recall DDoS being a lot more prominent in in the news back in the in the Mirai days. Um, you know, obviously DDoS attacks haven't gone away. You know, so so maybe kind of kind of catch us up between where threat actors were back then. And Mirai is a funny example, right? You know, because. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if most people have read uh, uh, Andy Greenberg's story, uh, you know, basically a bunch of kids behind Mirai, you know, that that uh, had some smart ideas and, you know, things kind of got away from them and, uh, and they ended up uh, renting it out and somebody used it to take down uh, Dying DNS, which took it wasn't half the Internet, but it felt like half the Internet because some. I think it was, it was a lot. Yeah. So some pretty key, key sites, uh, suffered from that attack. And, um, yeah, I guess, uh, run us up until today because it seems like cybercrime groups and threat actors are even more well organized than they were 10 years ago. And, you know, how much, uh, how much of a day-to-day tool is, is DDoS for these companies and, and how profitable is it still for them? Yeah. So that's, it's an interesting, just DDoS as a phenomenon or a, or a method of attack has been around for a long time, right? And it comes and goes in waves. And it's really, really funny, interesting to me where you'll have a period of two years where you don't really hear about anybody getting attacked, right? And everybody's like, okay, cool. And your staff rotates out. You you don't renew your contracts with, with your vendors that are protecting you. You start to um, not architect 
your networks and applications in a way that you need to in order to protect them. You basically lose all that know-how or intellectual property. And then there's a period of two years where everything's getting attacked and you're like, what's going on? And you have this, this great wave of attacks. And then you have to relearn all the stuff and renew all the stuff and re-architecture all the stuff that you that you forgot about or that lay dormant on the side there um, for that two years when nobody was getting attacked. So it's really hard from just an economic perspective of how do I how do I plan for that? Because you're it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you get the, you know, dare I say it, black swan event. And you're like, oh, my God, now we need to remember how to do this. Um, and so history does repeat itself. And we've had waves over the years. So I worked the um, Operation of Babel in 2012, 2013. That was a campaign of DDoS attacks against um, against the U.S. banking or large financial services. Um, we had a large set of DDoS campaigns right around the time of Mirai. Um, the Brian Krebs and Dyn DDoS was the first part of that. But then the internet hated itself for in you know and was broken more or less for another six months after that. There's still functional workalikes to Mirai that are out there um, being used today. They're just composed of different devices, different vulnerabilities, uh, different command and control. But the basic concept is the same, which is go find devices that nobody's used, nobody's maintained. They're internet accessible. Use an exploit to take them over. Put your own firmware on it. Um, that firmware connects it to a command and control server or a set of command and control servers that you have, and then you can use them to launch junk traffic. Okay, so that was the latest, like the last big wave. And Mirai was 2016, yeah. so it was 20, 2016, 2017 was a busy time for that. Um, also, in that time was the uh, Australian census, uh, kind of a debacle. Um, it wasn't really a DDoS, but that was claimed as a DDoS, but that was right around that time. And then things really went quiet. Um, we started to see a little bit more DDoS activity in 2020 um, and 2021 when everybody was working remotely, right? So you've got a lot of people, now they're VPNing in. We just didn't have enough, we as an industry didn't have enough VPN capacity in order to get people into our internal resources. So you just had a capacity planning and overload issue. So it was really easy to come in and knock people's VPNs offline. And so we had some of that, but that isn't public because it's all like, it's your internal resources. It's not a public facing website, right? So that doesn't get as much news time as, as, you know, taking down websites and things. Um, and then recently, so um, ever since the uh, the Ukrainian invasion, um, there's been groups of hacktivists. Sometimes they're nation state states. Sometimes they're not. There's kind of the spectrum, and they're all over that spectrum. But they're launching DDoS attacks against anybody who supports Ukraine. Right. right. And so there was a point in October of 2022 um, where, in a period of a week. Uh, this one group that we watch, they had taken down the 15 U.S. state websites, a couple development sites. Um, I believe there was an IRS one, an FBI one. Um, it was really good for them pub for publicity, but maybe the impact wasn't there, right? So, for example, I grew up in Idaho. There's not much there, right? Idaho has a population of just over a million people. If you crash their website for a day, did it really impact anything? But it gave them the ability to basically come out and say, wherever you're at, we can attack you successfully and we can cause some kind of damage. Those potato farmers. And so so potato angry. farmers, yeah. Silver silver mines, forestry, you know. Um, yeah, so so motives here, you know, I I think DDoS attacks are are interesting because you know, generally, uh, they're, they're not very precise tools. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we've got remote code execution, privilege, privilege escalation, all kinds of vulnerabilities out there. 
Um, you know, and DDoS isn't necessarily always a, a vulnerability. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have to leverage one. You just, you know, uh, have to fill the capacity of, of the pipe, for example. And there's all different kinds. But those, uh, you started off talking about the banks in 2012, 2013. Was the motive hacktivism back then? Because that was a big thing for a while around that time, right? Um, yeah, hacktivism has uh, come and gone, right? So just like DDoS comes and goes. Um, I was an instant manager way back in December of 2010 when there was all the DDoSs around WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Um, so I was part of that um, on the defense side. Um, I have to specify sometimes. Um, I was part of the defense of that and I was an incident manager. Um, so it's been, you know, sitting there and kind of coming around. One of the things that we've seen a lot of since then is uh, the rise of patriotic hacktivism, right? And you'll see it. Sometimes it's it's rather humorous. Like um, there was one that was, I believe it was um, Vietnam and Malaysia. They had a football match for the Southeast Asia F- Football Cup. Um, and it came down to a lot of penalties and a lot of fouls. A lot of players got ejected. So everybody from those companies went on, or from those countries went online and started attacking critical infrastructure in the other, in the other country. So that's kind of, okay, that's humorous a little bit. Um, Other places, you know, not so much. And that's kind of what we're, what we've been seeing over the past, say, 18 months or so, which is a lot of hacktivists that are aligned with Russia going out and really they're launching an intimidation tactic against people that Maybe they say something bad about Russia that week or they provide some kind of support to Ukraine, whether it's whether it's policy or whether it's um, um, just uh, material support or military support or providing equipment. Um, Really what they're looking for, what the attackers are looking for is just some kind of political messaging right? Ultimately, that's what they want is they want free publicity for their cause and to do some kind of intimidation around it, Mm. right? So to basically, like literally, the message is, look, you're you're not that good. We can come in and we can cause an outage and cause you damage. Um, But what I've noticed is sort of a trend. They do have some bigger targets that they go after, but, um, and they're, and those are really notable. But it seems like they're doing what in the gaming world we call seal clubbing, um, which is kind of an off color sort of thing. But um, it's they look for targets that are defenseless. So they'll probe a lot of things. They'll try a lot of targets. And then when they have success or they feel they have success with one, then they'll pile on additional attacks and actually cause a more more um, sustained or longer duration attack and cause a bigger outage against that target. It almost feels like in some ways they pick the targets that are easy that they can crash. And then retroactively, they have like a little staff meeting and they're, you know, I could just picture them having their staff meeting going, okay, how are we going to justify this? Right. And so they'll pull out a, they'll pull out a reason. So, Oh, well, it's because it's because, um, this organization has a pro LGBTQ um, stance, right? Right, and okay, how does that equal you know military support for Ukraine? It doesn't, um, and I guess that's maybe one of the the a third goal that's there, which is in order to take maybe political issues or just issues that we deal with in the West, um, you know, polemic issues. And then supporting one side of the issue and attacking their opponents and then supporting the other side and attacking their opponents just really to to add more fuel to whatever that discussion or disagreement is that we're having. Yeah, yeah. Almost just um, chaos for the fun of it. And then they try and structure it after the fact. You know, it's 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 interesting. I've, I've heard of cases where you know, patriotic hacktivism can lead to uh, military issues also like, Mm -hmm. you know, patriotic, patriotic hacktivists take down 
uh, like I, I recall a couple cases of uh, ISIS where you know uh, some amateur folks went after ISIS sites and US US Intel was like uh, we spent six months getting access to that server and we're using it to collect Intel and you guys just pulled the rug out from under us yeah <laughs> yeah it's a bad yeah. guy website but that's where our Intel was coming from yeah and you'll see that reflected a lot in sometimes their targets but also in their groups. So there's been a main group or kind of an umbrella organization um, that, that we're concerned with, and that's KillNet. And they started out and they said, hey, we've got this service, so you could pay us for this service. It's a booter service. Um, so it's like a web application that sends DDoS attacks, right? You go and you take over web servers, or you just go pay for, pay for cloud services using Adrian's credit card. And then you stand up this web web application there, you log into it, and then it allows you to launch your target, right? Launch your attacks at whatever your target is. And so they started out as one of these services like DDoS for Hire. And then the invasion kicked off, and they're like, well, um, now we're attacking targets that that Russia doesn't like or that are against Russia. And so they did that. And then they broke apart. And it's almost like like D and D communities or open source projects where you have one group and then some people don't like the way that the group is run. So they branch off and they form their own new group or there's a new project or a new, um, new campaign. So they, you know, some of the major players there go into that campaign. And so the weirdest one that I've seen was the DDoS attacks. And this goes back to, I think this was, late 2022, early 2023, um, where there was a video of somebody inside of Sweden burning a Koran. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. So you remember that, right? Right. And then all of a sudden, there's this group that comes out of nowhere called Anonymous Sudan. Some of the same actors, same characters as in um, as in Killnet or some of the splinter groups out of that that now they're like, hey, we're anonymous Sudan and making people think that they were part of the Muslim world. Well, Russia has allies inside of Sudan um, because they have a civil war that's been going on for some while, some time. And now anonymous Sudan is attacking critical infrastructure, right? So like government websites, notable brands inside of Sweden, simply because of this Koran burning and then you find out later that maybe the guy who was burning the Koran and filming it was also Russian. So it's right. this weird, like, let's create a cause, launch attack traffic around it. But really what they're trying to do is just get, to get the West to hate each other even more. It's pro- it's propaganda 101, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, like none of it needs to be true. Like you just need to sell a story that people can run with and, and has some logic wrapped around it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, so kill net, like, like uh, the other thing I, I don't think we've mentioned yet is, uh, where I've heard DDoS, uh, mentioned probably the most in, in the last decade or so it is in conjunction with ransomware, you know? So I, I, I've, I've heard of it being used as like, in, you know, like they've taken the data, they've also encrypted some data and they're launching a DDoS attack, you know, just trying to put that extra pressure uh, on a uh, mm-hmm. on a target to try and get them to pay that ransom. Yeah, definitely. We, we see that. And DDoS, even going back 10 years ago um, or 15 years ago, was very tightly related with just regular ransoms, not ransomware. Right. So take the malware out of it. But it was basically a protection yeah protection racket right so like hey you got a really nice website it'd be a shame if something were to happen to it and you pay them and then they wouldn't attack you um and we saw that like there was a huge campaign that i i did incident response for back in december of 2010 um along that lines right where it was it was a specific content management system so they went out and google dark for the act for the targets um, and then they would give you a protection racket or protection notice, and then they would DDoS you. So that's always been there. But then in the meantime, ransomware became a thing. And so one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is people get 
uh, they get ransomware, they don't pay or they take their time paying and the attackers will throw in a DDoS attack really just to increase your level of pain and the likelihood that you will pay. Okay. And in the industry, they use this phrase and I absolutely hate it, but it's called DDoS is a smoke screen, smoke screen or a distraction. Right. I'm like, well, I can think of things that were more distracting, but it does a couple things. And one of those is it attrits your incident response staff. Okay. And I had an incident years and years ago that I was working and I was helping out these folks and they were an e-commerce site. They had actually been successfully hacked, right? So more like SQL injection and the attackers were, were siphoning off data or exfiltrating data. But in order to do that, they had to scrape the site. And they also had some, some domain administrator accounts. So they had a, a privileged level of access and the target or the victim said, hey, we, we know that we've been hacked. They started to do their incident response, started to do their cleanup, and they immediately came underneath a DDoS attack. So at that point, you have to make a decision. You only have enough incident response staff. So do we want to fight the thing that's going to cost us money right now, which is an outage on our website, which costs us in direct revenue today? Or do we want to work to clean these folks, these bad guys out of our network, which might end up costing us in three months, in six months? Right. right? And, and you might never be sure that you got them completely and you don't, out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so you see that. Um, and then there's another one, which is um, if you throw a small DDoS at a target, and we don't talk about this enough because we don't really want to encourage the bad guys to do this. Um, but a lot of boundary protections for popular websites, they have the big red button, right? So, and they do this inside of their web application firewalls, inside of their load balancers, inside a lot of their application stack where that application stack will only take a certain amount of transactions or HTTP requests. And so if you throw some volume at that, at that application stack, they actually have to go in and turn off some of the protections that they have. And so if you throw a small attack, it doesn't, it, it doesn't crush the infrastructure. The infrastructure is up and still running but you get the defenders to turn off some of their protections and then you're able to attack them more effectively to do your more traditional data breach. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things you were talking about, like, I, I don't know exactly when this happened, but it, it seemed like, uh, you know, maybe around the 2010s, uh, you know, DDoS uh, protection and, and started to shift more towards services than people trying to do it on prem. Right. Like, Hybrid was was a thing for a while, but uh, you know, I, I I wonder if that uh, if that has made it easier to defend against this type of stuff, or you know, I'm sure there's some some complexity there there it's, as well. You know, and you're talking about it coming and going in waves. So, you know, is this something that people pay for all the time? You know, or is it still very common for people to you know say, hey, I need some DDoS uh, protection yesterday. You know, like the in the moment that it happens, they're, they're like, yeah, oh. it happens. It happens a lot. So uh, two years ago, I wrote a white paper. It's still it's out there. It's still valid. Um, but in it, I say there are six different technologies or architectures that you can use to defend your website. Right. Ranging from over provisioning or even over provisioning on a cloud. Right. You just buy a lot of stuff, buy more capacity than you need. Understanding that you'll have peaks that are higher than your normal your normal user traffic, or you can buy on premises appliances, right? And they're they're really overly simplified. They're IDS that understands DDoS attacks, okay? Mm -hmm. Or you could get the same. It's the same kit really, but through your ISP or through a third party scrubber. We happen to operate one of those, or you could go the whole cloud and web application firewall route, or you could the, load, the last use, one uh, load balancing, right? Yeah. I'd say um, like a lot of 
well, load balancing is like cloud WAFs or load balancers, and um, they're just deployed um, with a like a higher or larger amount of of infrastructure, so just scaled out really. Um, and then the last one is you just you just black hole the traffic. You basically give up and say, oh yeah, the path to this network is to go through the null null um, device on routers. Okay, so there's six different ways, and all of, out of all of those six not every single one of them has downsides and it has things that it's really, really, really good at. And so most people that are playing this game are using two or more different technologies. So for instance, they'll use a cloud WAF slash CDN, and then they'll use um, a third party scrubber um, to balance out those, those positives and negatives of each of the solution. And then they'll have a strategy behind that that says, well, if the attack lasts for this duration and it's of this size, here's what our playbook is. Okay. So even us, um, so yes, we're a provider of mitigation services, but we do a lot of, we put a lot of effort into working with our customers to build runbooks. We make that available in our customer portal, but it's, you know, what are your criteria for when do we drop traffic from the Middle East and Asia? Um, or where do we drop traffic from, from North America? Um, what are your key business times, right? And maybe it's like e-commerce, um, easy to do. They have cycles. But what if it's in between Thanksgiving and Christmas Day and they want to get as much revenue as they can because that's where they get you know, they earn 75% of their annual revenue in that one month. So they really are reluctant to start blocking traffic. They're very sensitive around false positives and blocking legitimate users because, you know, the spice must flow. They have to keep income coming in. Um, you might have geopolitical things, right? So what if your uh, political leader, you know, whatever country your political leader is, um, visiting a different country, you don't want to black hole traffic from that country, or you don't want to drop traffic from that country. You want to fight through it. So there's a lot of planning and um, logic and sort of codifying what that plan is and what your criteria are and making sure that your operations staff know what that criteria is, how to make decisions and then how to actually execute on that decision, right? And you have to do that because DDoSers are not nice people. This is not a shocker, right? Like not a shocker, they're jerks, okay? And one of the things that they do that we've looked at a lot is the most common time of the week to launch DDoS attacks is Friday at 5 p.m. Oh, evil. The, it, Right. And that, and that's exactly. So and it's not coincidence. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. Right. That's that's actually oh, planned. Like, wow. Um, I've seen some DDoSers that were very polite. They were only during business hours. Right. But most of the time you do it at night um, because you're trying to disrupt. You're trying to disrupt operation centers, incident response staff, in addition to the infrastructure. Hmm. Wow. You like you talking about them not being nice people. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like I'm pretty sure I've read stuff about them hitting each other as well. Right. You know, like, mm -hmm. like other. Uh, <laughs> booters, so like, so I lived, I lived in, I lived in Singapore for three years and um, this was, this was before online gambling started to pick up. Right. So we have sports betting um, throughout, throughout, um, East Asia, it, it, that was been a huge business for a long time. And you would go talk to these guys and they're like, oh yeah, we know that bot because last week we bought time on that bot to DDoS our competitors. Wow. And this week they're using that same bot to DDoS us. That's just, uh, that's just the way that they do business because when you do things like sports betting, right, going back to that business cycle thing, you do sports betting the two hours right before the event and even during the event are right. absolutely critical for sports betting and everybody wants to make their bets. But if you do it, say, a month before that big event, 
well, you know, it, you take a one day outage, nobody really cares because, well, there's just not that much demand for the for the services or that site. Yeah. Wow. All right. Good stuff, Mike. Um, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in Enterprise Security Weekly today. Yeah, thank you. And for those listening, uh, we have a ton more uh, links and details in the show notes. Uh, there's a great one. It, it sounds simple uh, called Understanding DDoS Attacks. What is a DDoS attack and how does it work? Uh, I know you're going to look at that title and think, oh, I already know all that stuff. But I, I checked that out and there were new terms in there. You know, it, it talks. It, it's more like uh, I, I would have named it the state of DDoS in 2024 because you know, like there's a lot of refresh terms and threat actors and stuff like that in there that that I didn't know. So that that's a that's a great one to check out. And then uh, Michael's own application layer DDoS attack blog post, and then the 2023 DDoS statistics and trends, which has some really interesting stuff in it as well. All right, thanks again, Mike. Um, yeah, we should do this again sometime. Oh yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back in a few moments with the weekly enterprise news.